seems like I'm losing 10 students every day. <laughs> Am I doing so badly? Get, no, no, they're good inside. Okay, so, wow, I'm, lost, I'm left with the last two-thirds of, of all the students, huh? What did I do to scare you guys all off? Is it all the robots? <laughs> They're not going to jump out of the screen and kill you. Oh, well. Okay, I think by now I hopefully have persuaded you. Learning a model, then computing an optimal control law based on the learned model, was a really good idea. Chris Atkinson and Stefan Schaal did it, and they made a lot of robot learning gold on it with it. And well, they this worked quite successfully for them. But then I also so explained to you that a small error in the model is de detrimental. It destroyed my robot and made me go back to my Max Planck director and tell him, oh, please give me a very expensive repair, 10,000 euro repair, in the first week of my robot usage. So we saw that this optimization bias, which the optimizer will exploit with a, when working with an approximate model, can be detrimental. And for that reason, we moved to value function methods, following the ideas of Rich Sutton, and basically seeing what in robot learning actually made Martin Riedmiller so successful in RoboCup. If you can fill up your space, your relevant space with the samples, you can actually compute a value function without having a model, and you can compute, uh, well, quite nicely an optimal control policy without explicitly modeling your system. So that's actually also quite amazing, but again, there's the caveat, you need to have the samples in the right space. And now if I look at a humanoid robot, well, we all know it's not always with a space which you can even fill up with samples. So you need to somehow sometimes become smarter, uh, well, smarter is the wrong word, sometimes become, well, even closer to the system. And that has led many of us in robot learning to pursue the idea of policy search. Interestingly, that idea is, um, well, thanks to the efforts of, uh, of OpenAI um, and Sergey Levine and Peter Abiel, now be has become a little bit too sexy for its own good, since many of these algorithms don't work as well as they make you believe. I know it since I developed some of them, despite that they don't have my name on them anymore. Um, so take it with a big, big, um, well, we not a grain of, of salt, but um, maybe more bag of salt um, when you read any of the OpenAI results these days. So let's start out by why actually we like to do, well, policy search and what actually brought us to start. And it wasn't actually the filling up the samples part. It was much more this part of, well, if I had, an, well, a navigation problem and I had to go to the left of the table or to the right of the table. And back then, well, greedy operations, well, seemed in value function methods really the many ways the way to go, like in Q-learning, and which would make you go very aggressively either to the left or to the right, despite that these two options had only very, very little difference. So and this has a big problem because if, um, let's, since basically, if you have a small change in your value function, then this can, small change can cause a detrimentally large change in your policy, which in very high dimensional state action spaces will screw you over and not become stable. That's something which we saw with the greedy operator a lot. Now you can do value function without a greedy operator, but this is really what, what got, well, policy search originally started in robotics. And that policy gradients, which would somewhere take the derivative of a policy, would actually do something much more stable because a small change in the well, in, well the sufficient statistics, not even necessarily a value function, um, would uh, well, only cause a small change in the policy, which gives you a more stable uh, learning loop. And this 
obviously, well, this was one of the big, big reasons why people got into uh, policy gradient and policy search in robotics. The second reason is going to become actually more important when we get to the second part of today's lecture, that we can actually build upon imitations much easier, since we can directly initialize a, a parameterized policy by an imitation, which usually gives us a good starting point, just like in tennis, where the tennis teacher gives you a forehand and a backhand by kinesthetic teaching. This gives you a very good, well, initial policy representation, and you can subsequently improve. So, and in a way, there's always been two ways of, um, doing, policy, of doing policy search. One idea is, was the black box approaches, where we completely ignore that we have any knowledge about the system, we plug in some parameter perturbation, we get some output perturbation back. Now, if we see this as a Taylor approximation, and in this Taylor approximation, solve for the derivative, it becomes actually quite a straightforward least squares problem where you can get um, your derivative. Now, rebranded under the name of random search, Ben Recht, for example, is just, well, very deeply impressed large chunks of the reinforcement learning community by basically saying, oh, if you do finite differences, um, you can actually beat many of the state-of-the-art algorithms on the OpenAI benchmarks. In a way, yes, we knew this for, what, 30, 40 years. Yeah, but actually, Kiefer Wolbowitz goes to the 50s. In robotics, people have been doing parameter perturbation well, as, as long back as I can think, um, so I've, I know methods from 30 years ago which did robot learning by parameter perturbation. In, but in order, and well, other kind of what Ben calls random search, but which actually just means finite difference gradients. And there's a ton of methods since the simulation uh, optimization community has been using them well, since the start of Kiefer Wolvowitz in, I think, 1952. Uh, so you can really find them all over there. And then there is the second kind of methods. And the second kind of methods are the likelihood ratio policy gradient methods. They're more of a white box approach. And they have, um, they have been on and off in, in reinforcement learning for also a very long time. The first time they were around was in the was when neural networks were totally hip the last time, so in the second neural hype, um, when basically he, people like Gula Pali and um, who introduced them under the name SRV and Williams, who introduced them under the name of Reinforce, popularized them in reinforcement learning. And they were in other fields, again, they're much, much longer known. The simulation optimization guys um, knew it for the, about them for at least one more decade um, with the work, for example, of Peter Glenn. And what they have as an assumption is that you basically write down the probability of a trajectory. Always in the end boils down to that. And once you have the probability of the trajectory and let's say the rewards of the trajectory, you can discount them if you like. You don't necessarily need to. Well, in this case, you could write down the expectation over this trajectory distribution. This trajectory view actually makes it much easier to derive things than the state action view in this case. And um, then you use one trick, which is called the log likelihood trick. And it's actually as primitive as it gets, you go back to your high school studies, you remember the derivative of a logarithm of a function is just one divided by the function times the derivative of the function. Every one of us has seen this in high school, the Russians probably even in primary school. Um, so in the end, you can rewrite this to it, also this derivative, then of course, in terms of the original function and the logarithm our derivative of the logarithm of the original function. Very primitive, but it's very, very useful for us because we can now do one trick. We take the derivative of the expected return over all possible trajectories, we write this NAPLA operator, we move it to the inside, 
And um, once you move it to the inside, well, you can do this because the integration limits don't change. And once you move it to the inside, you replace this derivative by, well, just the probability times the log derivative. For your first thought should be, why? Okay, this hasn't changed anything. Until you do one trick. You use samples. <coughs> when you recognize, well, when you use samples, you actually only need this term. You don't actually need to know the probability anymore. Now, that again should initially make you feel, well, okay, fine, so what? But once you compute the log derivative of the probabilities of a trajectory distribution with the Markov assumption in there, something really, really cool happens. First thing, all the products become sums. Okay, that's a more stable derivative. That's generically good. And then we recognize, well, this guy doesn't depend on our policy parameters. And this guy here doesn't depend on our policy parameters. So what has happened? Well, thanks to the log, we have a big constant. And the sum of the log, log policies is up here. Now, once you take the derivative, well, the derivative of the log trajectory distribution just becomes the derivative of the log policy. So that has made our life obviously much, much easier because we don't need to carry a model around. Now, you not, should notice one important thing, though. In the moment where you move to deterministic policies, you actually, um, if you want to keep the log, like, this whole logic of the log ratio likelihood gradient around, you have to, again, um, bring the, well, you have to bring in a model. But if you're working with stochastic policies, you're totally fine. Now, in the moment where you plug now these two things together, so we plug in our log uh, policy derivatives and we plug in the reward, and voila, we have something which is called the reinforced policy gradient. Yeah, and what happens? People tried this reinforced policy gradient, and some people were really good at tuning already in, well, the 90s, these during the end of the last neural network hype. And what happened? Well, they managed to train actually quite some impressive things. There was a guy called Ben Brahim who even taught a robot, very basic robots on gates on how to walk. Um, and there were a few other people who did fairly impressive things with it. But most people who tried this algorithm completely failed. And this is a very interesting implication because what we're having here is we're having a basis function vector which can point in pretty much any direction and we're always multiplying it by a positive number. So thinking about this, let's say this is our 2D parameter space and here's our current policy. Well, we may have just like let's say two such, unit, such vectors arising from the log derivative now. It could be more depending on our number of actions, but let's say we just have, well, let's make it four. Let's make it four. And if every one of them is now multiplied by a positive number, well, this obviously means that each of them has a contribution pulling into a different direction. And that, of course, well, when you have this completely clean, you have infinitely many samples, this is easy, and your gradient will actually be tinyly, your resulting gradient will be a tiny vector. Can you even see this from that far? Can you see this still? Okay, I'll just trust you. You, you, you will have a tiny vector somewhere going to this direction. But most of the cases, we have noisy gradients, and now we have noisy and a really bad signal-to-noise ratio. That was one of the reasons why, well, people stopped using them and it didn't work well. Now, there's one trick, let's hope, oh no, I didn't put it on the slides. There's one trick with which you can work it already, make it work much, much better. And I did not put this on the slides. This is the idea of a baseline. So you can actually subtract a constant value from this without so you take r minus the baseline and can subtract a constant value from it um, without biasing your gradient estimate. The reason for that is that, well, if you were just doing the, 
fuck. You're just doing the probability log probability that's of the well, of the path distribution. This is zero for the reason again that um, the sum of the derivative of p is zero, which comes from the fact that well p sums up to one. This block of the baselines makes a huge difference because now, despite that we have these um, basis vectors in all directions, now we would actually only have contributions into one, some directions. And even if we are slightly stochastic, our gradient would be going, well, on average in the right direction. So this idea of the baselines has been around again since the early 1990s, so since the last uh, neural summer, so to speak. And um, nevertheless, it still worked pretty terribly. And people only managed to make it work by, well, having the baseline, and they managed to make it work by having very peculiar learning rates. And we actually figured out, and this really the biggest credit goes to Sham Kakade, who introduced it originally in a heuristic way, and then both Drew and I independently figured out uh, that this actually was the, well, that it was actually the true way of doing things. And that is that you should be doing what Amari already introduced in supervised learning, you should be doing a natural gradient. Now, a natural gradient sounds like, the first time you hear about it, it feels like a totally fuzzy construct, until you learn what it is really about. And giving you the intuition, it's actually quite amazing. And so the intuition is that a normal gradient is when you take a black circle, you put it onto your parameter uh, space, and you make it sufficiently small, and now along the line of the circle, you search for the best point. That's what the steepest descent with respect to, uh, uh, to a circle means. And in the moment, well, we could do something like here, we have a problem with the probabilities being between 0 and 1, and again 0 and 1 as parameters, and we see that the gradient here would always bring us to the edge. It would never bring us to the optimal solution. So quite clearly, if we were deforming this metric so that it points more to this direction, this would be a very smart thing. Now obviously, deforming a metric is something the second order methods do with the Hessian, and people initially tried this, of course, on reinforce with a Hessian, and reinforce with a Hessian just simply didn't work. Because it, it still had the, well, it was deforming into the wrong direction. It was, in fact, pushing you even faster into the boundaries where you had, well, zero exploration and therefore zero improvement. So then basically, you could do what, well, then you, of course, need to realize, well, what kind of deformation do I need? And that deformation is, of course, the big question, well, in what kind of space do I want to live? And, of course, I live in the trajectory space. So if I want to compare policies, I should compare this by what difference do I make in trajectory space? So with, if, if I basically want to measure what difference my new policy with a parameter change of delta theta does. Well, the right way of measuring this, or the most natural way of measuring this, is by taking the KL between, well, the new distribution and the old distribution. In the moment where you want to approximate this KL, well, what do you get? You get a constant and, well, you get one half delta theta times some matrix F, some delta theta again. Right? This is just a Taylor approximation. We don't care about the rest. So we be, and this year we don't care about either because it's a constant. And we suddenly have this magic term. In supervised learning, or even in unsupervised learning, this magical term actually is the Hessian, because our objective function is the same probability distribution usually as the um, as basically the where the space where we're living in. 
in reinforcement learning, on the other hand, the space where our trajectories are living in is a different space is, is different from our objective function, which is only used in the expectation. Asian, if you take the derivative, then only of this expectation with this additional reweighting. And this was in supervised learning. Well, Amari makes the point. This is the Hessian, and it's actually a very effective way to compute the Hessian even um, in um, supervised East learning. While in reinforcement learning, this Fisher information matrix is, well, in the path space. That was really the key difference between what Drew and I did to what Cham did, that um, we figured out that you have to do all of this in the path space, and that way get the correct um, Fisher information matrix. And once you plug it in, well, you can plug it in, for example, as staying within a circle, where the circle radius is an epsilon, and this would give you this kind of a deformed matrix. Once you solve this optimization problem, something fairly cool and magical happens. Because just like as if you were going with respect to a Hessian, you are actually just going now with respect to this Fisher information matrix. And it comes with a really, two really nice things. Fisher information metric, the Fisher information metric basically punishes is you quite rapidly if you want to go outside of the parameter space. Because you are going to, if you're going to the edges of the distribution space. So you're not very likely to go for zero exploration um, if you bound your loss with respect to the Fisher information. This is one big advantage. This is an exploration, exploitation related advantage. The second big advantage is that it actually has something that it in, which is called the property of being covariant. This is something we totally underappreciate still, especially right now in the time where gradient methods have become, parametric methods have become so powerful and useful all, all over. You want to actually have it that if you reparameterize your algorithm, you give it a slightly different representation you actually want to have it to give you the same answer. I mean, this is a request which Donald Knut wrote down in the 19, I don't know, 50s, 60s, in one of those first books. Um, he made that request of algorithms. In the machine learning, we're actually fa mostly failing on that because um, well, everyone knows we normalize everything so that we get somewhat more predictable results, but um, that's kind of the most hacky way of how you could do this. Now, in within, once you use the Fisher information, you actually, at least for linear reparameterization, get exactly that. So, is it useful? And I can give you a very strong yes here. I've taken two very simple problems. One is, again, the problem of, li of linear quadratic regulation. In this case, with a stochastic policy. You've already seen how you would do this with a model learning for optimal control. And it's just a 1D LQR problem which I'm choosing here, and I have here the controller exploitation, so the, the amount of noise I add to my actions, and here I have the, uh, sorry, exploration, here I have the controller exploitation, which is basically the gain which I multiply on top of my state. Similarly, here we have the two-state problem, where one probability is here, the other probability is here. We all see you want to be in the state where you get a two reward, and you want to take the two as many times as you get, um, but if you are in zero, you kind of are biased towards staying there, at least if you're looking at immediate reward, while transitioning gives you nothing. Now, if you look at the regular policy gradient, you see it's actually doomed. So even when you do the baseline trick, you do the best possible tricks, you're doomed. Because, um, well, for the LQR policy gradient, you would actually only learn exploration is expensive, let's get rid of it. And voila, you, wherever you are, unless you're directly located at the optimal gain, you will just end up at a solution which, has, um, which ends up exactly at zero expiration. So, not particularly nice. And here, in verse for the two-state problem, well, if you are already close enough, well, you may get to overstaying in, um, overstaying in this state, but quite frequently, you get actually pretty bad um, 
local optima, such as, well, you actually want to stay in zero all the time because you get immediate reward there, um, and you won't actually get to the optimal solution. Well, if you look at the natural gradient, that even in the worst possible scenario, so the scenario where you nearly always stay in zero, you will keep, stay, you will keep going to the optimum along the edges. And that's really the power of knowing the metric which defines your space. And, well, damn it, I thought I had a video here. So one thing we used this for was for back then teaching, for example, a robot to hit a T-ball. Um, I don't know why that video is missing, um, but I will just continue from here since we don't have enough time today. Question. Oh, look, 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 look here. The gradients in LQR all point to the optimal solution. They are like, they are the ideal gradients. And in fact, you can even show for LQR problem that the natural gradient in, with the right learning rate will always, oops, will always with the right learning rate end up directly in the optimal solution if you have estimated it, well, infinitely precise. So you could actually do a single step there. Uh, the, this right learning rate is, is actually surprisingly simple. I think it's just the square of the variance, uh, one divided by the square of the variance and the ex expected return, something among these lines. Um, I would have to look it up. I derived it 15 years ago. I don't remember it. Yeah. It would, it would basically try, I mean, look, the gradients point all downward. Yes. They would go all to zero, to zero exploration and, and therefore stay at a constant gain. Now, why am I bringing up these, well, pretty old results? Well, most of the algorithm, which you know under the name TRPO, does actually nothing but, well, it's basically nothing but a different renaming of what we used to call episodic natural actor critic. It has some tiny variations in it, but there is extremely, well, there's basically nothing really new in there. And this makes much of the mileage current, what's currently going on. Now, I still want to take you away now from this idea of, um, of doing gradient descent and policy space for the simple reason that in robotics, this is a terrible thing to do. If you have to do this on policy, on a real robot, so I, I'm sorry for not having this video. At the, we did this ball on a, uh, this T-ball example where we put always a ball on a stick and the robot was shooting that ball away. They required on the order of 1,200 trials to get this right. This meant that I, as a PhD student, had to run through the lab 1,200 times for a single trial run to get the ball, put it back on the stick. Now, can you imagine how frustrating that is? Pretty frustrating. So for that reason, we, in robot learning, we have been doing something for well, a very long time now, and that is that we are trying to search for alternative, well, for kind of for surrogate functions, um, which make us more efficient but are built on this, in the insights of, well, supervised learning. And this is where I really want to lead you. And it really has some very nice foundations in how humans do stochastic actions. And but when humans do stochastic actions, they do something pretty crazy. And that is that when they're learning from their own trials and iterated decision problems, they do not just jump to the best action or the best policy but they take the reward-weighted frequencies of actions and outcomes. Now, that's pretty crazy, and, but in the end, it allows you to keep exploring while doing, well, kind of larger steps along the, larger steps towards new policies, which are not necessarily even along the gradient, but, and which don't require a learning rate. So we want to create a new policy, which is kind of like the old policy, just reweighted by, well, in this case, for the immediate state action scenario by the rewards, but more frequently by the rewards. Now, sadly, this is, of course, only possible for non-negative reward functions. Intuitively, 
this looks a lot like classification. If you had a 0, 1 reward, well, I would want to jump only to the 1s and not to the, to the zeros. But let's make it not 0, 1, let's make it 1 and 2 reward. So that in, for the 1 and 2 reward, we would, like, would of course like to rather grasp a, two, a 1 um, in addition to all the 2s than having no data at all here. That's kind of the intuition there. And this turned out to give us something very useful. And this had, again, in the bandit scenario been realized by Peter Day and Geoffrey Hinton a long time earlier. But nobody had made it work in long-term reinforcement learning or even considered it. Where we make the reward an improper probability distribution, move to the log from the basically in supervised learning the log likelihood to the log expected return, and then get a, from this get a lower bound on your expected return, which luckily has the reward only here. So we can and so we can and the policy parameters of the new function only here. So we can actually make this NEM algorithm, which jumps relatively fast from good policy to good policy. You can really arrive policy gradients that way, but that's not very helpful. Um, but it would give you again and again a new bound, and you would do very small updates. But it also allows you to do larger steps. And well, oops, this here is the scenario of ball in the cup, where we, starting from an imitation, learned exactly this behavior. I'll let the video play out one more time for you guys. I already have shown it to you on Monday. You would actually give it a small reward based upon proximity uh, between ball and cup, and it would get better on a trial-by-trial -trial basis. Unlike before, we did not have to rush through the lab that much, um, and we needed way, way fewer trials going from the thousands of trials, we, are sudden, we were suddenly in the domain where we could learn things within hundreds of trials. Which for robotics is actually quite a big difference because in the end, real robot time and time and even worse, well, real robot time is already costly in comparison to computation time. And, and then in addition to that, it's not just real robot time is costly, you need to multiply real robot time by a very large factor which is the factor of you taking care of the robot, repairing it, bringing back the ball, bringing back the, uh, well, untangling the wire if the experiment has gone awful, um, and so on. In the end, within 90 trials, we always got to perfection. I don't know a single human being who makes it to perfection. I think the best humans get to a success rate of 60%. I think that was a fact that I didn't notice, on, didn't say on Monday. Yes? Mm -hmm. filming what's happening, yes. and mm -hmm. then you take the film, you process it, and then you run the next trial. How long does the processing take? Oh, in this case, we, have a, we had a ball detector, um, so we would directly get a, out, of the ca out of the vision system, we would directly get a 3D ball position and velocity. And that was immediate. Immediate. Yeah, um, the, the biggest step is, well, com computing the policy update, but even that is, uh, was nearly immediate. So, um, if it had you just run your forty-five trials, yes, one after another, just like this, pretty much. So it's quite a step from when I what I showed you yesterday. Chris had to always wait for a night of um, doing dynamic programming through a big neural network back then, um, where he well, while we actually we were running this in, in a chain, we would. You know, on one afternoon you can run, run I think, 20, 30 tri the complete trial runs without actually, um, yeah, too much bothering. Um, it's still that you need one afternoon for, well, one plot in a figure um, just of uh, when your experiment works perfectly. It's still quite a step from, well, when people deal with simulation. Yes, sir. This is not a mutation approach. This is a, a policy search approach. If you start with a human with an initialization by imitation, for the simple reason that searching this space is um, on a real system is not a feasible option. You could now, of course, do what well, what we've studied talked about yesterday. You could learn a forward model and then you could incrementally uh, search this space um, with all the pros and cons ends of doing that. 
Steve X says there's a mechanism says that some swing it twice before I make a move like this. In this approach, like for humans initializing the state such thing. Yeah, it's like you need one swing. Mm -hmm. But in the if a human is guided such like if there are two, three swings before you make mm -hmm. a swing, will it when during the policy search, will it know that okay one swing is sufficient and so will it forget the so this depends. Right now, we only give it a, a reward based on proximity of ball, minimum proximity of ball and cup, which is a relatively informative reward, I gotta admit. Um, and it doesn't tell you anything about the quality of your actions. If you plug in what we did earlier, when I, when I didn't show you the video, but the one where we had the ball on top of the t-ball stick, there we had to actually give it a reward which had much more assumptions in there. So obviously we had the reward we were interested in, and that was the reward of shooting the ball as far as possible. But that is very quickly achieved by a policy. Initially, you get a lot of immediate reward by, uh, of, of earlier reward by just hitting as strong as you can, even against the T-bar, the not even against the ball. Um, this flies already quite far. And the system would directly go on this path and probably never recover, and in addition to that, break the robot. So there, we had actually a punishment on the actions in addition. If you had a punishment on, on actions, you can unlearn more of the human demonstration. In robot table tennis, we actually had to do a lot of unlearning of human trials. And that had to, in this case, we didn't even need to do it through the reward function. But there, it happened pretty much automatically, because humans can do very high accelerations, much higher than robots can. I mean, robots can move faster. They can move more precise. They can see more precise and easily, and they can see faster. But robots cannot accelerate like humans. This is the advantage of muscles. And for robot table tennis, we saw one thing in the well, first kinds we were learning forehand strokes. We would show it a stroke, and the robot would be pretty terrible at it. Because humans flick, right? They do a really quick acceleration through the ball, which is obviously a very effective technique of, of moving a ball, right? I mean. Velocity, the outgoing velocity of the ball is, well, the incoming velocity of both plus the duration of time where you accelerate through the ball. If you accelerate uh, it uh, with such a flick, the ball can be at the other end. The robot can't do that. So the robot basically just had the reflection. And so it had to move for longer to get to a higher speed and then just reflect um, the ball better. And it would learn exactly that um, during, well, when we learned forehands in table tennis. But, and this is simply because we had a max out of the acceleration, um, which came naturally out of a max out of the torque. And um, well, you know, when you commanded the robot to do higher torques, the motor just wouldn't create these torques anymore. It would saturate, as they call this in robotics. Now, I think for policy search, um, or at least even in, in robot reinforcement learning in general, I think we, we are having th always three key problems. And one is that, well, getting a notion of what data is, in the prop getting this into the problem formulation. In value function methods, we really do this heuristically, where we plug in data. We always have this problem of an optimization bias. It gets particularly bad when you're using a forward model. And the role of features is nearly always unclear, here or how you get actually features in a non-artificial way in there. Since if you do what people do in supervised learning with the features, well, this, this very rarely has, um, well, how to put this, a natural relation to reinforcement learning. Now, I think there's what you should take back from the whole policy search idea is that, well, you clearly should do as much as you can on the observed data distribution in robotics because that's the only data we know we have for sure. The second part which you should take back is, well, you should always punish the divergence, the distance between your state action distribution, which you're generating under your new policy, and the one which you have observed up to this point. And finally, well, we have to actually define our MDP on top of feature functions instead of, um, well, hoping that we can find some abstract states um, which actually make sense. And you can actually hard code these assumptions by taking the classical optimal control problem, 
and now, well, oops, adding, well, just these red components, where here we you have, oh, sorry, this should be completely red. So just these, this completely red equation of bounding the information loss plus being only, only fulfilling the forward propagation on the features. And we get to, well, we, I think this is the road to go for developing reinforcement learning algorithms. In this particular setting of well, discrete stuff and so on, we actually can make this work. So we get a weighted Gibbs policy here, where you could re replace the delta also by the Q function if you liked. Um, since this is, well, it's the advantage function. Um, and what's most interesting, you actually get compatible critic functions. And these compatible critic functions fundamentally, well, they give you different loss functions for how to derive value function updates, which you can then again use, or value function or other sufficient statistic Dix updates. And this all resulting from well, the key assumptions on the um, original problem. So, quick wrap up before I move to the topic of imitation. Um, policy search is a powerful alternative to the value function methods and the model based is reinforcement learning methods. Personally, I'm not a fan of policy gradients at all anymore. I um, think they were a valuable step for me to understand the whole problem. But I think at the moment they're really misleading us and it's quite surprising how much, I mean, you, you have every major machine learning conference, you have 10, 15 papers on them. In reality, um, they're not, a, not such a good tool. They only work, you can only make them really work in simulation because you never get that many system interactions as you would need or when you had learned a model before that. And in addition to that, well, unless you do all the tricks of baseline and natural gradient, you can't really make them work that well. Learning the expiration rate is actually still a hard open problem. And I think the, well, the probabilistic approaches is, are uh, quite useful. Anything which has worked can, is so, has so far been shown to be linked to relative entropy policy search. There's some strong um, well, results by Gergely Neu that this is actually he, something very fundamental behind this uh, idea. Okay. With that, we're through with policy search, and I've, well, whoa, we're taking three quarters of an hour for that, minus the time we were late. Um, questions, guys? Okay, then I move on to, for the second hour to imitation learning. And I hope, so I have two imitation learning lectures, and one is on imitation learning by behavioral cloning, and the other one is by an um, imitation learning by inverse reinforcement learning. It really depends on you giving me signals of how much whether I'm going too fast, whether I make it through both of them. Now, imitation in re robotics is super useful, right? Demo getting a demonstration as a starting point can be quite crucial. And in fact, most of the most impressive robot learning results have been done by imitation learning. And there's two types. And one type dates back to, well, you could say Michi and Chambers. It's a really, really long time. And that's the idea of behavioral cloning. So what is behavioral cloning? Well, you would be like Garfield here. You show behavior to your robot, in this case a very human robot, and afterwards you use this behavior. Quite straightforward, right? Um, in human sciences, this dates back to the 1800s. Um, Thorndike called it learning to do an act from seeing it done. The first really impressive result of it was actually due to Dean Pomelo, who produced Alvin, which, well, reproduced steering actions for a given retinal image. Among the things you've seen, well, you've seen how to get from experience data to, uh, well, from my, this is basically all the different types of reinforcement learning. Well, now we are trying to get from demonstration data to uh, an optimal policy right away. And this requires that we look at, well, two different things. One is that, well, how can we teach a robot without well, too much programming? 
One is of how we can get actually policy representation, which is useful for robotics. And I will tell you a little bit about motor primitives. Let's start with the learning policies from demonstrations by supervised learning. Now, this is super successful for humans since um, it's, well, for the simple reason that, well, if you were learning what we do as humans all the time, we would still be in primary school, right? No self-improvement. Uh, but uh, just doing self-improvement, we could not explore the world sufficiently. And this, as the search space in robotics, just like in humans, is usually too large. And on the other hand, you usually have in robotics, you have an expert who knows, well, what is a good policy. Think about the neurosurgeon. I mean, if you ever have a prostate operation in your future as a man, well, most likely this is not going to be executed by a human directly anymore. This is actually executed by a human joysticking a robot. And it's quite, um, quite impressively, the human is joysticking the robot without haptic feedback. So just from seeing some pictures of, well, a very tiny part of your body from the inside, the human has to figure out, um, well, where to cut and, well, how to not cut the wrong thing um, and save you, let's say, from cancer. And it turns out that nearly all interesting animals can do some form of imitation learning. Yesterday I learned that even bees already do imitation learning, which I hadn't known. But um, for rats, this is really well studied, that when there is a companion rat, a rat will, um, rat will imitate it. Um, and well, you can block this and subsequently uh, well, see that um, um, how well it does imitation learning. For dolphins, it goes even further. They can, they are directly programmed to even imitate facial expressions of humans. I mean, given that we are a totally different space. And that's also the case for infants, which even at the age of 42 minutes can, they don't always have to, um, learn how to copy uh, well, facial operations. So we're really, so kind of like when you think about it, if you think of us humans as a robot, and you think of imitation, well, it's probably it's not very unlike. The best comparison you could think of is, it's kind of like with the BIOS, the BIOS, so B I O S, in a computer which has a bootloader to load the operating system. In the same way, you have to think about imitation. And well, we do this with a lot of different ways in robotics. So we teleoperate robots. But by with the joystick, we do kinesthetic teach-in, where we well take the robot by the arm, just like a tennis teacher. We use sand suits like this here, where we plug a human into a suit so that we can give the robot trajectories from that. And well, then we can do market-based training, or in the best case, we would actually be doing complete computer vision and reconstruct from three, from well a video what the human was doing and put that onto the robot. The last part is the holy grail, but I don't know of any well, good results which has actually worked with the last part. Yes, sir? Uh, just a curiosity, but uh, young infants are uh, at 42 minutes, can they even see? And yes, they can see. Um, they can see very well. Um, you can do one experiment, which most of the childcare books um, propose to you, um, draw smileys and see how they react to smileys from which range and um, that hap that they can react to that very quickly. So they basically have to stop crying. That's why they need it here, in this case, 42 minutes. Um, I think I didn't try it with my twins until they were a couple of days um, old, and it only worked for one of them. Um, but then you can actually show um, why well, can, they can, they, if they want to, they have already a little bit of their own will at that point. Not a lot of it. Um, they will imitate your facial expressions. So, but seeing is, is, uh, is near instant. That's actually why the complete computer vision community for a very long time said, oh, we just have to find the right priors and then vision will be a totally easy problem. And in a way, what the deep learning guys did is they found the right priors by 
well, deep learning and big data sets, at least for some of the vision problems. So we, we clearly don't learn vision. That's that one you can take for granted as humans. Other questions? Okay, now let's say we have chosen one of these um, operation modes. And now the idea of behavioral cloning is surprisingly simple. Well, we have a trace of the expert's uh, actions. So it could be velocities and positions of the joint angles. And now the student has to infer a policy, which in the old days used to be a deterministic function. Um, these days we usually think of it more like a probability distribution in order to not limit the actions of our, dem of our robot so much, especially as we would like to use this probability distribution later for reinforcement learning usually. In principle, in behavioral cloning, we can treat this as a supervised learning problem. And if you treat it as a supervised learning problem, well, you could extract the policy by assuming some features, some parameters, and you just have a regression problem. Now, this sounds totally crazy, right? Why would this work? Surprisingly, in most cases, it works surprisingly well. And a part of that is that your regression problem actually cleans even up the human data and you get a smoother and better solution than what you have demonstrated because we humans have a lot of jitter and the learner, uh, the learning system will clean up this data thanks to regularization and in the end give us quite frequently something which is better than the original. Now we can represent this problem in two ways, in the state space formulation or again in the trajectory based formulation. And we do this usually using parametric policies. So a conditional distribution of actions given state and parameters. And we can do this quite nicely from continuous actions. We demonstrate and do the mutation learning. And well, if you want to improve, well, we would need reinforcement learning afterwards. And we have quite a few properties which we of course want. We want to find a representation with a low number of parameters so that we can do reinforcement learning well. We want it to be able to do reinforcement learning with it later. Um, we do want to have the variability of the humans. So humans never do exactly the same thing. The, you can again show that the variability which we humans have in our movements is highly functional. We will, when you show people a task like let's say dart throwing, nearly everything in there will have, will, you could model by a relatively wide Gaussian distribution extremely well, a Gaussian distribution over times, um, trajectory of t over the trajectories over time, except for that one moment where you're on the release manifold. Since for a successful dart throw, you have to be in a very, very small um, component of a very, very small area, and you have to pass through this bottleneck in the right direction. So exactly around this area, this trajectory distribution collapses and we are suddenly pinned down with very, very little variance. So on the one hand, yes, we do want to uh, take all the statisticity and keep it, but only when it doesn't harm our behavior. And well, sometimes we can even decode from this distribution then what was the reward function of the human. And well, we want to be scalable to many degrees of freedom and modular and be able to compose with it. And we want to do this both for rhythmic and for um, stroke-based movement. As I've said, well, stochasticity gives us variability and the expiration of the human. Again, the expiration, the tremor, which you have in your arm, when you all hold your hand in front of you, you'll notice your finger has a tiny tremor. This is actually functional. It actually helps you when you're interacting with an object and you're making and breaking contact, for example. Or when you're, the variability helps you when you're steering a car and it's a new car and you need to figure out, well, how fast does it react to your actions? You would, other, if you had to do deterministic exploratory movements, well, you would have to really do this here and you would do have to do it consciously. Instead, you get, the stochast get it due to the stochasticity for free. Well, for that reason, well, we try to learn the well, trajectory distributions 
um, where we in most cases even have well the different output dimensions quite um, correlated. And the first people to yeah oh yeah and you could learn this well with whatever supervised learning you like to have and um, the first people who did this used actually a linear representation for with the linear features and already in the 1960s used supervised learning to learn the task of pole balancing for imitation learning. So really just by linear regression. This was in 96, of course, a super great result because I'm pretty sure they got the input data by typing on a keyboard or something. Um, but that they could do this already was fairly impressive. What was more, is more impressive is actually the results these kind of um, things already did in the, now in the 90s in a flight simulator where um, you even see the cleanup effect already where the learned autopilot is actually doing a much nicer and uh, trajectory leading back into landing than the original trainer has been doing simply because he is not as nice. You can do this also well, with nonlinear representations. So these two were for linear representations, um, e.g. with RBFs or neural networks or mixture models, you name it. And the most impressive thing for that has been in the 90s, mid-90s, or early and mid-90s, with the NavLab. Now, mid-90s, you got to imagine, was the time when we thought autonomous driving was nowhere in the future, in the foreseeable future. People had tried to hack it up for a very, very long time. And it was really, in the end, imitation running and, well, a few other methods which showed this was a wrong assumption. And um, now today we are in the opposite extreme. They promise us that we will have autonomous cars in the next two to five years. Don't buy it. Um, I think this could be even one of the causes of the next neural winter that um, Silicon Valley CEOs have completely bought this idea of autonomous driving will happen in two years. And, well, they will be disappointed for sure. Um, that much, um, I think, pretty much all the autonomous driving guys even agree upon. So, um, yeah. But back then, well, an autonomous car required a truck full of computers, sensors of this size, so this was a LIDAR, um, so laser range finder, and um, well, they actually used this to show that you could learn to drive all the way from CMU up to San Diego with the no hands on the wheel, with the, on the no hands across America tour. And that state images, that these camera images, and all they would be using is doing is they would be predicting the steering wheel, the brakes, and the gas. And they did this with the two layered neural networks working on a 30 times 32 sensor of the retina. Um, and you would get, well, these kind of signals in there. Now, luckily, this, of course, only works because they were doing this in America, right? Try to do this on an Italian road. Um, I'm pretty sure they would have failed right away. And I don't want to think what would have, would have done on an Indian road where there are a lot of people, even more people than Italy, are running over the street at arbitrary moments. Um, so in the end, just nonlinear regression. And I hope this video works. I tried it this morning, so blame the computer if it doesn't. I really hate this about my new computer. Here you see NavLab, and you notice it is going rather slow, right? Um, but nevertheless, completely autonomous. Um, human is just sitting back, filming, and here you're on the road. You notice this is still in around Pittsburgh, um, well, which is rainy and um, cold, kind of like Germany. And well, I think this year is already in a much nicer area then it has some obstacle recognition, but um, well, it is going at a speed which, uh, even the camera, when you look at these camera pictures, how slowly they went, you recognize that this was mastery of, of the sensing and acting technology of the day, just as much as it was mastery of the learning technology.
So, now you should have some doubts on behavioral cloning from state action pairs. First of all, I can probably always make this breakdown. Um, and um, I can do f catastrophic failures. Yes, if I bring you to regions of the state action space where you haven't been, um, I can do small changes to the system which make your policy unstable. And in the end, already as the, the students of Michi noticed, oh, well, a single human trajectory he nearly always worked best, so um, it doesn't actually work very well across different teachers. And there's no guarantee that the reproduction is meaningful, and even worse, we're doing supervised learning on data which we pretend is IID, which it actually isn't, right? It's correlated through our trajectories. And, well, this gives us, well, not necessarily the really good long-term behavior. And, well, it's basically only when our actions are surprisingly uncorrelated that are the, from, drawn from the same distribution that the individual movements become easy. And this has led us in imitation learning to develop time-dependent representations, but we really have a time in the policy as well. So this could be, well, really follow longer-term trajectories by having internal state variables. And it, it's one way of doing this is, for example, to learn what people in control call gain scheduling, where we have some weighting function which, well, schedules both gains and offsets. Of course, this becomes already a much harder learning problem, but at the same time, it allows us to, well, learn, for example, a variable stiffness controller, which is a really important thing. You want to have a controller uh, which can, when I step down here, I want to be very precise for a long time, and then I want to, in the moment where I make contact, I want to be as soft and squishy as I can, and for that, I need a very, very different gain uh, than before, and just the moment before when I wanted to be as stiff as possible so that I can be very precise. And, well, we can learn this with a variety of things. People originally started out with a kind of spline-based representations in order to directly learn this trajectory and control law. Um, for a long time, RBFs then in time um, in, you know, in time and state became very popular. And I think by now, most people who do imitation learning of some form do this in a form of encoding your behavior in a dynamical system. Now, dynamical system, you could think of always as a very specific, in this case, a very specific recurrent neural network. And, well, let's go through one of these strategies. Let's go through what um, Stefan Schaal once started calling the dynamic movement primitives and um, show you a little bit of the results there. So basically, what we're learning is a well, trajectory generator which can, react, can or cannot, if you don't want it to, uh, react to your actions. And imitation learning with the trajectory gen generators well, requires that you will learn long-term behavior, but you want to follow a trajectory, and um, you obviously need still something which maps desired trajectories to torques, which in robotics turns out to be a rather simple problem. And the easiest way of how you could think of a dynamical system which would encode a behavior a trajectory, well, think of a first-order differential equation. Pushes you to a goal, stops there. And, well, you could deform that one. You could actually now create, well, a second-order differential equation, which could do more. It could overshoot, go back, for example. And, um, well, even more, you could do something which has attractors, repellers, and so on. It could get unstable. Uh, if you wanted to, you could even, well, encode things like limit cycles or chaos that way. What was a surprising result from neuroscience is that humans, in the end, appear to have something like a... Um, well, like a dynamical system's representation of their movement, and even more interesting, they appear that they would have this um, in either a discrete form of a point attractor or a rhythmic attractor, and they would be stored at different locations in the brain. 
That was a result of the early 2000s. And it gave us this, this big understanding that, well, we only need to encode two types of dynamical systems in the end. And into these systems, we can actually put in all the abilities hard-coded, which allow us to learn, uh, well, to learn movements which we need for anthropomorphic robots. So we can encode stability, perturbation robustness, whether it's a point-to-point -point or a periodic behavior, um, we can put in more complex shapes. We can learn them quite fast, as you will see. And we can couple higher degree, higher number of degrees of freedom and have things like rescaling, retiming, and generalization to other um, external factors. And all we do this is by starting with this initial assumption of a spring, an overdamped spring, which pulls you to a goal. Then taking this spring and, well, adding a forcing function to it so that we can, with this forcing function, encode more complex profiles like, for example, doing this here. So which would allow us to first, instead of directly having to go to the goal during a tennis movement, would allow us to go back and then through, the, through that particular point. What is particularly nice is that such a dynamical systems representation only depends on a phase variable usually somewhere. And you can rescale time by rescaling, well, this parameter alpha z, but at the same time with the alpha and beta, you could actually rescale amplitudes. So this is rescaling with the time and at how well we can go differently fast. So higher tau, higher speed. And now we could represent this forcing function by some form of, an, uh, of a weighted basis functions approach. Um, for example, here in matrix form, and by construction, get a, for, a stable forcing function, um, which even is guaranteed to converge, as on the long run, it becomes just a uh, PT controller for infinite horizon if you go wrong, uh, if you let it out run forever. Integrating the system then obviously leads a trajectory, and when you perturb it, you can actually go to a different parts of the trajectory. So we would start now, well here we have a periodic movement, which has a latent variable z, um, which is kind of this reset um, dynamical system. We have some basis functions here, and from that we could um, take, well, we could actually learn this complete movement from data. We can change a goal of the movement by moving this, this g, we can change the temporal scaling, and we can change the amplitude of it. So in the end, it becomes actually quite simple to learn trajectories with this. You first take a desired trajectory and its derivatives. You, you obtain from this the final position, for example, use it as a goal. And you have, well, timing and amp you have amplitude and timing parameters, which um, you extract first from, um, or set add them to normative values. And subsequently, you can modify them for doing movement composition. Then you compute all the target values and just do a linear regression as before. And you can do surprisingly cool things with this. Now, this here is Auke hitting a tennis, yeah, well, hitting a virtual tennis ball. And, well, this here is the humanoid robot um, DB um, hitting in this case, uh, well, real table tennis ball on a stick. Whoopsie, no, that is not what's supposed to happen. So we use this for an imitation running for rhythmic behavior where we now would give it um, obviously the position of the ball to couple to. So we gave it more state variables into the imitation running approach. There's a ball on a string and um, you learning the right parameters for the human movement was actually pretty much out of the box. And again, as I've told you on Monday, um, hacking up this behavior after six months with the best possible control engineering methods did not hit the ball more than two or three times. Finally, you can do things like what Jun Morimoto did in Japan. He learned um, a coupling to, uh, the f um, well, to, between the floor and the robot's gates. 
And he actually started, he actually got his imitation learning thing in a very weird way. He took human data from a book and by hand took the trajectories out. And together with the, well, with the coupling in of to the floor, so he also extracted that again and manually from this Japanese textbook on human movement. And he actually got a pretty good policy, um, one which would allow, well, this robot to, uh, just to uh, walk. So this gives us, well, the big advantages of, well, uh, these are the desired on movement primitives. We want to be data-driven so that we can easily learn from demonstrations. We want to generalize. And we, then we want to be able to combine primitives by activating them together, rescale them by changing the timing, couple them, uh, uh, represent the coupling between the degrees of freedom, have the variability of, uh, of the teacher, and ideally even have the optimality of the teacher and do this for both rhythmic and discrete strokes. Now with the deterministic dynamic systems motor primitives, we only got some of these. But in the moment where you move now to trajectory distributions from a deterministic function, and um, you basically do the same step as what we did when we moved from linear regression to Bayesian linear regression, or from kernel ridge regression to Gaussian process, well, you also do this movement and um, get a trajectory distribution and also a generator over, well, over act dis trajectory distributions given some additional input. And we can do this by, well, representing a single trajectory first with, the fa with this phase dependent basis, have a probabilistic model, and then, well, actually integrate out all the parameters as we would do in Bayesian linear regression. And, well, let's do this with our, we can do this with our old friend, the Gaussian, where, well, it gives us mean and variance from a human teacher's uh, distribution where, uh, well, and we can do this obviously for multiple degrees of freedom right away in order to, uh, well, in order to get all this then our trajectory generator. Now I want to go through this fast so that I still hopefully have time to tell you a little bit about inverse reinforcement learning. Um, I will not tell you all of it, obviously. Um, that's why I'm hurrying through this now. But you could now really, well, encode the complete well, a trajectory generation distribution here generated by optimal control. You can do this then quite nicely. You can, um, you can also, well, very nicely go for different goals. And um, even nicer, if you have two different demonstrations, so the blue one and the red one, you can actually combine them now into a new path distribution, and by that, modular, completely modular, like completely modular, um, combine two uh, totally different behaviors. Just one which goes through these two via points. This goes through this via point, and it leaves open all the behavior in between for further learning. S switch through that. Now you can learn things like this Maracas task, which is kind of a shaking task, um, and blend between different, well, different styles, and even go back and forth between different styles. Um, in an ice, in a, we call it an ice hockey task. If you've learned from Canadians, it's more like curling what we're doing here, um, where we combine two primitives in order to, um, well, either get, oh, sorry, very first use the reparameterization to get angles or different distances is of the puck traveled. And well, when you combine these two, you can actually get, um, well, you can, you can basically use any kind of location you want to get to. And similarly, by conditioning, we could, um, well, do selection. So, that means we have actually solved all of these core questions, core desire, desired us for a movement primitive representation. Obviously, one primitive is not enough. Instead, we really need an architecture like this one here, where, well, we have many primitives, which all create motor output, dependent on visual input, which for us usually means some form of information on the object and, well, on the teacher. We've applied this in robot table tennis, 
where we have the scenario of your ball launcher, different cameras, a teacher, a ball, a buried wham, and a table tennis table. Even I'm in the picture, surprisingly. So, now we have many different primitives we could learn, forehands, smashes, backhands, and we somehow have a selection mechanism, let's call it a gating network as a mixture of experts, and which could select based on incoming ball, own position of the robot, opponent's movements, and prior opponent play. And, well, oopsie. Now here you basically see the, this is the wrong one, wait, here you see some resulting thing, robot table tennis playing behavior, and um, in this case only forehands, but it can also do backhands, and well these are different forehands by the way, it has 25 forehands I think. And um, well, you can learn table tennis quite well. So, we have four core questions in imitation learning which we need to answer. What I've answered today to you is actually a tiny outtake. Since in the end, well, what have we, what to imitate is at what level of abstraction is actually a really hard question. It's somewhat even an ill-defined question. Since um, I mean, we have the obvious questions of how to deal with outliers, redundant data, the, or data that's irrelevant to the task, but then actually, well, and maybe even figure out the relevant components, but at some point, well, we actually need to figure out the level of abstraction of where we want to imitate things. And um, if you're getting from A to B, could be done by very different means. Well, maybe we don't need to imitate walking when we could step into a car and drive if the imitation part is just about getting from A to B. Then the how to imitate is even for this task we consider a really difficult one. Personally, I like to avoid this question by doing kinesthetic teaching. After all, humans do it in tennis too. But um, practically spoken, well, the body of the teacher is never the same as the body of the student. We already noticed this when in table tennis, when we take the robot by the hand and show it accelerations, it can never reproduce the accelerations of the human. So it needs reinforcement learning for any of the faster movements, uh, any of the high, uh, any of the movements, more interesting movements, in order to uh, well relearn them so that it could actually accomplish them. And well, the body of the teacher is really never the body of the student. And so, but instead we have this correspondence problem. Then, when to imitate? I don't think anybody has even started answering this question. But um, if you really want to build a robot that imitates, well, you would rather want to first sit it into the corner, it should watch you, and that then it should start to decide, hey, I want to imitate only the second, this particular segment. I have no clue how you would actually answer this question. And then it gets much worse when you recognize that, oh, there's going to be multiple people in there, in that scene. And the whom to imitate, well, that makes it just crazy then. But I think these are questions we need to answer in imitation learning in the future. And, um, yeah. Now, I have 20 minutes. In these 20 minutes, I would love to still do, I mean, I'm sorry for being so much slower, I don't understand, totally understand this, um, since I still want you to understand a little bit, oops, this is the wrong one, this is the one from, this is inverse reinforcement learning, okay. Since I would like you to understand at least on a basic level um, what's happening in the last type of robot learning. I mean, you have learned about Model learning, you've learned about three ways of reinforcement learning, and you've learned about one way of inverse of, of imitation learning. And when you look at it, then, well, behavioral cloning can bring you very far, but it also requires lots of demonstration. And in the moment where you want to have intentions or goals, 
or you need inverse reinforcement learning, which is also known as inverse optimal control, inverse optimal planning, and so on. And um, what it does is it determines the cost function of the teacher to obtain optimal behavior. And the basic assumption behind it is, well, the reward function is actually a more concise description of the behavior than, um, well, the actual behavior would be. So what have you done so far? You've solved four problems. One more to go. Let's be over with this. And we are gonna, I'm not going to do all of it today. I first want to do a comparison to behavior cloning. Then I will very quickly go through these um, three categories. And I will probably skip some of the applications and give you a conclusion. Now, in behavior cloning, you would obviously look at, again, the same problem. We have some state, some learning algorithm, which wants to do the actions like this rover here, which belongs to CMU, which is supposed to get here. And it's, uh, well, has brush here, it has rocks here, it has grass here, and a tree here. Obviously, you want to avoid the tree, you want to avoid the rocks, and only as a last resort, you want to go through the brush. So you really want to find what's invariant um, to these different features as they're observed here. And Surprisingly, the people who do inverse reinforcement learning, they actually focus on one of the biggest successes of behavioral cloning to take it apart. Since they look at the old NIPS paper of Alvin, um, where they, well, found this wonderful quote that if the neural network is not presented with a sufficient variability in the training exemplars to cover the conditions it is likely to encounter when it takes over driving from the human operator, it will not develop a sufficiently robust representation and perform poorly. In addition, the network must not solely have been shown examples of accurate driving, but actually to recover, i.e. return to the road center, once a mistake has been made. When you read this, you actually recognize, oh, wow, it felt like it's fall, some collapse fall in front of your eyes away. Since you directly recognize, ooh, this was actually a pretty dangerous thing which they did. They just drove so much um, that they hoped that their state action distribution would actually resemble a realistic state action distribution. In reality, though, um, if they had had to, like, I don't know, frequently had to recover, had to have a recover behavior of a little person, like a little kid running in front of the car, probably wouldn't have worked that well. Uh, since they would have had this recovery behavior exactly once and um, in the training data, and if this had happened again in the test data, most likely the cleanup effect, which was so useful for making trajectories nicer, could have also done away with it. And even worse, you don't want to show the robot system 15 or 20 recoveries is of the same situation, or even a million recoveries of the same situation. So you really want to give these demonstrations more weight. So you really need well the right variability in your demonstrations. You need a, well you need to have lots of these demonstrations, and you want to recover from your mistakes. And that was been introduced in the context of imitation learning which these days is set equal to apprenticeship learning, despite Peter Abiel actually meant by apprenticeship learning the combination of, in imitation, of um, imitation learning through inverse reinforcement learning followed by additional reinforcement learning. And the important preposition is that the reward function provides a most, more succinct and transferable definition of the task than what the policy can tell you in terms of the behavior. And in many domains, this has become super powerful. And um, well, for example, well, for uh, um, well, model, and you can do some modeling of agents. You can ask, answer other scientific questions like how do bees forage, how do songbirds uh, vocalize, what cost functions underlie these kind of animals, as are humans. So, I mean, for human movement, there's a long-standing question of. Is it minimum jerk? Is it minimum torque change? Is it minimum endpoint variance, which generates human arm movement? 
And that's a big debate. While for locomotion, it seems to be pretty clear it's minimum metabolic energy. But finding these cost functions, that actually would be, well, job of inverse reinforcement learning. And we do the, we'll discuss this a bit within this crusher robot um, scenario um, from, well, we have seen before in the introduction. And inverse reinforcement learning would actually want to learn a cost map now for a planner in, or a control policy, he, he, he gener uh, any form of control policy generation, such that you would uh, not directly learn the actions. And, well, you directly recognize, well, if you had some features and some parameters, each of this would be a feature. This would be, this is yeah, obviously features to avoid, so with a big negative reward. You could place a big positive reward and um, would obtain, uh, well, you could obtain a good plan from it. So parameter would be high cost associated with brush, low cost associated with grass. And well, you could collect paths by teleoperation by taking this gigantic vehicle and you have goggles on so that you see what the vehicle sees and you, t you uh, teach it how to move. Subsequently, you may have the task of getting from here to here and this is obviously a helicopter view and if your training tells you stay on the road, well, it will actually do exactly this kind of planning, stay on the road, drive from A to B. It works also for other parts. Here you see an example of the underlying cost function, where the cost function shows you, well, this is a bit to the left and to the right, and, um, well, we are here on, well, we are basically choosing the minimum cost, but we would really be caught up if we were here um, or here, and this is from, well, cost from the satellite map. But you could even teach it to avoid the road. And, well, here you see an avoid the road scenario, but you want to drive through the brush, which you can, should not accidentally do with your own car, really use such a crusher vehicle, and this also works across other kind of, um, of terrains, and here you see that the cost map is also very, very different. Good. Oops, so let's cancel that one. Um, so how would, how does this work? The, the basic idea is that, well, we have a latent reward function which describes in which you, what we want to accomplish. We have a reinforcement learning optimal control method which gives us a policy and we have the dynamics. And now obviously given a policy or behaviors, traces from a policy, how could we recover the reward function? And um, well, that's the idea of inverse reinforcement learning. There, is, there are three methods in the literature for it which dominate things. And um, one is the maximum margin approaches, which um, one are the maximum entropy approaches, and the third are the um, well, are direct parameterizations of the policy. So let's have a look at, I'll get rid of all the, let's have a look at how this, how behavioral cloning worked. Behavioral cloning, we had traces of the teacher, we had long-term behavior, we would fix a policy class, we would estimate a policy. And, um, well, the long-term behavior would really be the problem. In inverse RL, we follow a different trajectory, a different path. Um, we again take the trace of the teacher. We want to have its, um, the teacher's long-term behavior. In this case, we assume a transition model, but no reward function. And we try to recover the reward function that explains the policy and the long-term behavior of the teacher best. So, with other words, the big core question is, can we, we use a candidate reward function to obtain the policy of the teacher and how to find it? Contrast this one more time. Behavioral cloning is simple to implement, has very few assumptions, um, but does badly on long-term behavior. And, well, generalization is more complicated and samples, um, uh, well, needs many samples. 
inverse reinforcement learning requires that you can solve the reinforcement learning problem involved. And obviously, it's hard if you are doing well a high dimensional little robot, for example. But if you can do it, the reward is a very compact description and it's very easy to transfer it to new task. Question. Yes. It is an ill post problem. Totally. Um, so it, 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 Give me a moment. So, let's start exactly with the comment of its ill post. So, what we want to have is ill policy, uh, we want to find a reward function which explains the expert behavior. So, we assume, first of all, we have a very limiting assumption. We assume that the expert is optimal with respect to this reward function. Now this, you can now go to the psychologists and they will tell you humans are never optimal. And you can start a long discussion with them that, that well, optimality, well, that optimality under what information state and then, well, never mind. Um, it gets big, you can very quickly find a big discussion there. But let's assume this expert is optimal. In this case, we want to find a reward function such that for this reward function, the expert pi a star beats all other beats or it's equal to all other policies. And immediately when you do this, you recognize, ouch, this is totally ill post. I think this is what you meant, right? Um, we have um, a reward function of zero would always fulfill this property. Then we have the problem of, well, we don't assume the probability distribution, which in pi, but we actually only, we only observe traces. And, well, what do we do if the teacher also makes mistakes? And then the worst is, yes, for all policies, and we obviously would have to enumerate all the policies. Let's do this first with the maximum margin approach, which made Peter Abiel famous. Um, and got him his job at Berkeley, where he used a feature-based representation of the reward. And when you have a, your linear in features and parameters, well, you can actually plug the parameters of your reward function out of all of the expectations. And you're basically only standing there with a feature average and, um, well, some parameters. And when you substitute this into our basic assumption, well, you have one parameter of a vector of the optimal policy, and well, there's a weight vector, and you have another parameter vector for each of the other policies. Now, this would mean that, well, we would have to find a, a, a W star such that, well, our feature, ex feature collections for the expert are always beating the other policies. It directly has two important implications. Since feature expectations, we can estimate without actually having access to the policy and um, thus have solve the limited uh, data challenge. And the number of expert demonstrations, well, it actually scales linearly, uh, scales well with the number of features in the reward function. So much better than um, like for the policy. And then basically, well, we do not depend on the complexity of the policy or the size of the state space. But we actually really just depend on, well, that there is this concise feature function, uh, concise reward function represented by our features. So in other words, we got rid of, well, one of the problems. And now we do the next problem. And that is that we don't want to enumerate, but we actually want to um, that we actually want to, to well only compare it to a finite number of policies. And well, this actually is a big advantage because you can plug this into the mindset of the support vector classification, which I think you've seen in the summer school already. And um, well compute now just the distances to a hyperplane separating the optimal policy here 
from all of the others in the right feature space. If you, which then allows you to do a reformulation and by this reformulation also solve this problem of, well, being ill posed. Since you can add a plus one here so that your optimal policy should be better by a, well, plus one, you could also give this a dimension, but the dimension is subsumed by the W, that you have to be better than this in a minimum norm sense. And from all of your knowledge about the support vector machine, you directly know this is basically, well, it's, support, uh, it's basically the same QP, and you can actually, well, let's stay here, you can actually solve this QP um, if you have been given a limited number of policies. You can even make this slightly better by now taking a, seeing a different margin depending on your two policies is so that, um, well, you incorporate some form of distance between policies is so, for example, the number of well, minimum distances is from the generated path, or, uh, the, from the example path. And this is taking away another problem. We don't have the ill postness problem anymore. And now we, well, now you can basically go to the part that you, well, want to, of course, incur high losses is whenever you're doing, well, too much damage, you have, you have too many, well, your hyperplane is moved such that, um, well, you're classifying this as a potential optimal policy. And, um, well, and you can then introduce suboptimality just the way as you do it in the support vector machine by introducing slack variables. And um, that way you could even deal with learning the solution for multiple Markov decision processes, not just to one. Still, there's a lot of challenges when it comes to the large problems. And, um, well, you could do way more than more um, for large problems. Now, I will skip because I have only two minutes left from what I understand. I'll skip the constraint generation, but that's basically one effective way of how you would create all these new policy candidates in, in the same time where you, where you create these new pies, you would automatically, um, well, you, you can automatically find the, uh, well, you can find a better and better to return function. Now, I want to highlight, on the other hand, one approach which, in the last one minute which I have, um, I'll maybe take a little few minutes extra, um, if you don't mind. I want to highlight the maximum entropy approach, which I personally find much more appealing, where people follow, where, well, people follow again this premises that, um, well, you want to be minimally committed, maximally uncertain about your actions, um, subject to that, well, your, your, ta your policy agrees to the feature averages you have encountered. And nearly all of the distributions we know, uh, well, out of the expansion distributions, for example, directly come out of the maximum entropy policy. And this really allows us a proper treatment of both suboptimal distribution, uh, suboptimal uh, experts, while at the same time giving us, um, well, directly stochastic policy, which I find, again, more appealing. So here we have the entropy, and here we would have constraints. If you solve this, well, you would actually get an expansion distribution, you would get a Gaussian. The same way, we can actually do this over paths. So it's just like for policy gradient, we could do this over paths from of trajectories, which then have to, uh, 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 trajectories of the generated by the teacher's policy, and we have to match the, te match the policy, the feature averages of the teacher, and get the right kind of path distribution. And we directly recognize, oh wow, this actually works quite straightforwardly. We could even plug this into the probabilistic movement primitives from the um, behavioral cloning lecture, and recover that way um, the reward of the trajectories. And, well, the only problem is, well, you need to figure out how to bring in the system in this case. 
if you want to bring in the system, you need one more step. You need to have um, a state consistency as down here. And um, well, if you do this, you end up with a policy as a function of basically the Q function where the V are the, the Grangian multipliers and well, this with the normalization together this becomes a softmax and this is a convex problem. It's actually, you can write it down as an X block, uh, log X sum so you can actually do this quite effectively. Now I'll skip the last one of par policies parameterized by rewards but that's basically the dual to that. You could also just write down the dual right away and do optimization on it, which gives you a parameterized policy. This brings me now to the last part, um, applications. There's been a hell of a lot, as you can see from this, and I will, actually these are fun. These I should show you. Hopefully they work. PowerPoint. So here you see driving behavior taught by Peter Abiel and well you notice how um, in one case it's learning very clean driving, in the other case, uh, sorry, in some cases it learns very sloppy things, in this case the demonstrations, here you see what the robot has learned, some very sloppy behaviors among that but all over um, the simulated robot has been doing quite nicely, um, still sometimes I it will do something very crazy, um, but all over, this is actually quite impressive. No. Cancel that I. Then you can do, well, parking lot navigation. Let me directly move to the video. Um, Here you see first a very good driving style. It has point clouds from an RGB camera. Um, and well, this first driving style, um, it will nicely go around and will do a very favorable way of getting to this parking slot. Um, I hope this works. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. I moved this presentation to a new computer. That was a really bad idea. Okay, let's leave these out since they're kind of boring, but you can explain humans quite well by it. That's, uh, that's all it is saying. And let me finish with the most famous example. And that is the helicopter work of, again, Peter Abiel and Enring who used such a helicopter to actually get to a human performance and acrobatics um, of real experts, where they both the, well, who are competing in competitions. And they would collect the data from the experts who use these joysticks to do acrobat helicopter acrobatics. They get IMU data, so again IMUs, you have seen them on Monday, uh, in order to know what the, where the gravity vector is and the accelerations of this, this helicopter and they have cameras observing where this helicopter is at, which all of which gets, um, well, well, it's used by the computer. They first do a Kalman filter and then they, um, which they obtain from that data and then they um, do a feedback, learn a feedback controller. And well, what are the, the four control actions since you have well, four things you can joystick. And let's hope this, I can't believe this, okay, let's take this video. Then I, this is, God, why did 
side of this. Okay. So, no, this is not it. Okay, then in this case, I will directly show it from YouTube. It's probably the smartest thing. Um, um, This is really something you should have seen at least once when it comes to inverse reinforcement learning. These were the milestones of, well, these behaviors were really, really tough back then. You must imagine this is 2007, 2008. At that time, we did not have these fast server controllers in the helicopters as today, where humans can control them much better than, than you really needed to be really, really good as a human to joystick like a behavior. And the, and the learning system which they had actually managed to learn all of these crazy behaviors, whether it's a loop, the loop, tick-tock, pirouettes, um, again loops, and, um, well, different turns. This is called a hurricane. I'm not quite sure. Well, maybe because it's kind of a spiral. I think they had an inverted helicopter in there, too. Uh, yep, this looks pretty inverted. And, well, gives you kind of a feel of um, you just don't want to sit in that helicopter, huh? This is an inverted helicopter hoovering even, um, which in, well, again, 10 years earlier was considered an unsolvable problem, helicopter acrobatics, to do hoovering because, well, people couldn't actually manage. And, well, let's close that part. And, um, well, ah, I, okay, the video would have been here. Fantastic. Okay. I screwed up by thinking I'd screwed up. I actually had the video here a little bit later coming. Um, this was just a photo before that. Never mind then. But important, importantly, yeah. Why is it? In the end, you should know why inverse RL is sometimes better than direct imitation running or behavioral cloning. You should know the algorithmic challenges, some methods, what is good about maximum margin and max entropy. Maximum margin originally got us there. I think the maximum entropy you see is a much cleaner way of doing things. And yeah, I hope to have given you somewhat an overview over most what is interesting within robot learning. I've only left away the problem of well, map building and, and estimation, um, which some people also count to robot learning. And I've taken 10 minutes more than I was supposed to. I hope that was okay. <laughs>